Tonight's lecture is, is titled St. Paul in Ancient Corinth, Archaeology in the Early Church. And um, I've billed this as a virtual tour. You'll see very quickly what I mean by that. Now, we are working hard at Aqueduct Project to do real virtual reality. I'm holding in my hands here uh, a virtual reality headset. We are actually dabbling in real virtual reality, but tonight's not going to be that. Tonight's going to be a slideshow in the same format so that everyone has a, a relatively easy time in, in uh, getting together with us. But we do like to press the envelope at what's possible with technology at Aqueduct Project. So I decided to have um, an AI create the artwork for this presentation. So this beautiful poster here that you see was actually created by artificial intelligence. You probably heard it in the news that OpenAI chat GPT is uh, taking the world by storm. It's um, um, become a very, you probably heard it in the newspaper or television. And it's a, it's a new form of artificial or new access point to artificial intelligence that's really intriguing a lot of us. And I, as I was putting together this lecture, decided to see what it could do if I asked it to create imagery that I would use in tonight's lecture. So um, you've probably seen chat GPT respond in dialogue form, in text form, but it, it, the same technology can also create imagery. So this image here, I ask, um, create a painting in the style of Van Gogh of the Temple of Corinth with the Acro Corinth in the background and a sky full of stars. And this is what it came up with. So that's the uh, artwork. I've got to give credit where credit is due. That's the artwork that we used for the presentation. There were a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, Chat GPT or OpenAI came up. Actually, it's DALI. It's the, the image building form of the artificial intelligence. When I asked the computer to, quote, create a painting of an ancient Greek temple with a sunset in the background, it came up with this image. I thought that was pretty lovely, and I was considering using that for the presentation, but opted, of course, for the other image. <clears throat> and this was intriguing, too. I also asked the computer, create an image of St. Paul in front of the Temple of Apollo in ancient Corinth, as it would have appeared in antiquity in the style of a 2D animation. And this is what it generated. I was quite impressed with this piece. Uh, the computer imagined St. Paul with a, I like the expression that it put on St. Paul's face there. Of course, St. Paul, being a, uh, a faithful Jew, would not have entered uh, a temple. That would, that's not something that we presume he would have done. Um, so also, for example, in, in his famed visit in Athens, he probably would not have gone up to the Acropolis or gone into the uh, Parthenon. Uh, so I like the expression that the computer put on St. Paul's face as he's looking away, moving away from disgust from uh, the Temple of Apollo. Okay. Enough with artificial intelligence and um, uh, imagined forms of what Temple of uh, what Corinth was about. Let's go ahead and start digging into some of the pictures of, of what we actually find when we arrive there. First of all, very briefly, just to give a uh, historical context for how it is that Corinth became such a, an important point um, in Paul's own ministry development. So here's a slide which I've uh, borrowed from the ESV Study Bible showing. Paul's so-called first and second missionary journeys. And I think it's the dotted line here that's Paul's first missionary journey. From there, he goes from Antioch basically to Cyprus, uh, which was where Barnabas, his co-laborer, was from. That was his home country. Uh, they make it up here into Galatia and Lycia. But, but the first missionary journey basically just uh, um, is the surroundings of Tarsus, which was Paul's home city. So Antioch, Paul's sending church and, and the environments not too far from Tarsus and Cyprus, where Paul and Barnabas were, were uh, uh, both from, Paul from Tarsus and, and Barnabas from Cyprus. Paul's second missionary journey is after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And this is the second missionary journey that's going to be the context for Paul's uh, first experience in Corinth. And Corinth is going to have a very special place in Paul's heart. Paul is going to work there for 18 months. And in many ways, the, the relationship that Paul builds there with the church in Corinth is a, is a unique relationship among the many churches that Paul networked with. So after, after Acts 15, the account that we read about in Acts 15, when Paul's down in Jerusalem, 
he and head he heads up with silas paul and barnabas split ways over the question of whether john mark should join the team uh paul heads up um and revisits the churches in galatia that he had started to interact with in Acts 13 and 14. You might recall that in Acts 14, Paul is stoned. He nearly dies. And that's during Paul's first missionary journey. So Paul's relationship with the churches there in Galatia is broken off. Paul returns to them in uh, Acts 16. And then Paul's trying to get um, he's trying to get to Ephesus, but the Lord does not allow him to go to Ephesus. Paul finally arrives there in Troas. He doesn't know what he's doing next, and, and God has to send him a vision, the so-called the call of the Macedonian man, come over and help us. And Paul then travels to Neapolis, Philippi, and uh, these cities here in Macedonian modern-day Greece. Now, Paul's entry, that's technically, according to our own geographical definitions, that's Paul's first experience in the continent of Europe. And Paul's uh, this is the middle of his second missionary journey. And Paul has a terrible time uh, in these cities. He's culturally probably disoriented. He's further away from home than I think he's probably ever been at that time. His credentials as a, as a student of Gamaliel and a, and a faithful Jewish rabbi, those, those um, credentials aren't known in these Greek cities or respected. They don't have currency in these Greek cities. So he's really on his back foot. In Philippi, you remember there, he's beaten and jailed. Uh, he's run out of town from Th Thessalonica after only five Sabbaths, maybe as long as, uh, or three Sabbaths, excuse me, I think is the counting. So maybe as, as few, no, five Sabbaths, which could be as short as three, uh, three weeks, excuse me there. So after a very short time, Paul has run out of Thessalonica. Uh, his experience in Athens is not as traumatic, but still Paul is separated from his team. It would have been a very difficult experience. Finally, Paul arrives in Corinth, and he must be exhausted at this point, and, and probably quite nervous. He describes himself as arriving. Uh, he later in his Corinthian epistles arrives and describes himself as arriving in Corinth, not bold, but um, uh, quite chastened. So this is a very difficult time for Paul, but he arrives in Corinth and makes it a spiritual home. And builds this unique relationship with the church there in Corinth. Now, what's amazing, oh, here we go. Okay, what's amazing, too, is um, um, the, the church there in Corinth, we don't know where the church itself met. Presumably, it met in villas or houses of, of um, um, wealthier citizens of the city of Corinth. We don't know where the church was, but we know a lot about the archaeology of the city, and that's because it's been under almost continuous excavation for uh, about 100 years. I think it was 1896 when the American School of Archaeology began work in Corinth, and, and many other uh, Teams, teams from many other places have been at work there too, and it's a very well-known archaeological site. So we have really a lot of information about the city of Corinth. Here's how Paul arrives in Corinth, uh, according to the book of Acts. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commended all, commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Okay, so Paul sets up shop in Corinth as a tent maker. And this key relationship with Aquila and Priscilla probably did have something to do with his longevity there, that he was able to make a spiritual home there. Let's, um, let's look at the geography and dive into the archaeology of the city. So where is Corinth? Um, Corinth is, plays a key uh, role in the geography of ancient Greece because it is the gatekeeper or the gateway to the Peloponnese. There we go, the Peloponnese. The Peloponnese, what does the word Peloponnese mean? The word Peloponnese is Greek for five fingers. And here we have it. This landmass is meant to look like a hand with five fingers. I suppose you have to count this piece here as a finger 
And uh, this kind of looks like a thumb over here. And we have three other obvious digits here. And it's a, a five-fingered landmass. Now, it's, it's a, uh, um, a peninsula, I guess. It's a half island connected by this this land bridge lead and not far from Athens okay which for many centuries had been a, a a key city Corinth was already a major city in the in the sixth century BC and existed probably for centuries previous to that but it was already a a, a mother city of Greek colonies as early as the sixth century BC so hundreds of years before Paul arrived in this area it was a wealthy prominent city and a great key to its wealth was that it controlled the land bridge this isthmus uh, to the P Penelope uh, P Penelope's oh boy there we go with that word again okay now this is the Isthmus of Corinth. Um, it's only about four kilometers wide. And that's the land bridge that connects this very large uh, half island, a peninsula, to the mainland of Greece. Even in antiquity, there were attempts to drive a canal through there, to cut a canal through there, uh, because ships, um, ships, in fact, were trans transitioned by land across this um, isthmus because it saved so much time if you could sail through this channel here instead of having to go the several hundreds of kilometers around uh, um, the, um, the landmass to get to uh, the other side of the, the sea. Now, I believe it was Nero who attempted to drive a canal through this landmass, the Isthmus of Corinth. You can see that today there is actually a canal. You can begin to see that there is a canal that cuts through that land today. That was uh, um, cut out after the age of dynamite. So it's only been there for about a hundred years or so. But um, Nero at one point had tens of thousands of slaves, many of them Jewish slaves, working to cut out this canal, what's known today as the Corinth uh, Canal. It was a dream of ancient engineering not brought to reality until after the age of dynamite about 100 years ago. But uh, to rewind here, again, the, the secret to Corinth's great wealth is that it controls this access to this landmass. Okay, here is a painting. Um, we're just about to go to the archaeological site, and I'd like to show you this picture, if it, uh, as it were. It's a painting from 1847. Here's what the site looked like um, not that long ago. So Corinth was left as a, as a ruin. Here in this painting, you can see uh, the plateau there where the ancient archaeological site was. It's, been, it's since been excavated and much of it reconstructed so that we really have uh, a, um, quite a well-preserved site to visit when we go there. But only maybe 100 and, 160 years ago or so, uh, it would have been a very, very different uh, experience to visit it than it is today. Now, one, I want to draw your attention to one other feature here of this painting from Carl Rothman. Ratman, and that is the so-called Acro-Corinth. Acro-Corinth. What is the Acro-Corinth? That is this giant rock formation um, at, at the base of which the ancient site of Corinth was built. Now that, um, for those of you used to the cities of, uh, of for example, the, the, ancient, the, the medieval cities of Europe, we often think that cities are built on waterways. And with the ancient Greek cities, that's not always the case. Very often with the, the very old, the, the, uh, the millennia old Greek cities, very often it's a, an outcropping like this that will draw the civilization to build a city there. So that's of course true with the uh, Acropolis, uh, in Athens, and it's true for several of the Mycenaean cities as well, that they were built near these natural rock uh, formations. Why would the cities do that? Well, uh, um, very, very surely, actually, because this, be this could be converted into a natural fortification. So in 
in the case of an attack, the people could go up to a fortified uh, part of, of this natural rock formation. And um, it was actually part of the city's defense. So city, uh, um, Corinth, is built right next to the Acro Corinth. Acro comes from the Greek word for high. So Acro Corinth just means the high Corinth, the, the tall or yeah, elevated Corinth. Acropolis in Athens just means the high city. Okay, now this is a virtual picture. This is um, thanks to Google Earth. I'm going to show you a lot of virtual pictures from Google Earth as well. Here you can see um, the data that we have in the map is modern, but you can see this is where the ancient archeological site of Corinth is. This is the Acro Corinth in this, this computer graphical reconstruction. And this is the Isthmus of Corinth. Again, that's only about a four kilometer width there. Uh, that's all the landmass connecting the, uh, the um, half island to the land, the, the mainland. This is what the archaeological site looks like today. Now, this is what the archaeological site looked like in antiquity. This is the best reconstruction that archaeologists uh, can make. And we're going to look at a number of these pieces here. But I want first to pair out these items with the... Uh, with the archaeological site as you visit it today. So look with me just here. This is the Temple of Apollo. This is going to be the very central part of the uh, archaeological site in Corinth. If you look at that Temple of Apollo, this is what it archaeologists have imagined it to look or re have it in a reconstructed build um, as it looked in the in, during Paul's day when he was there in the first century. Okay, here's the theater, and today. All that we can see is this, not much left, but you can see you can see the very core of the theater right there. That's still preserved, and the staging area over here, that's still preserved as well. So here's the staging area, and down there at the bottom of the well is the, the very core of the theater. The, the theater was built into the side of the hill, so not that much of it is left. And of course, the, the marble seating and so on has been taken and used for other construction projects over the last 2000 years. But you still have the imprint in the hill of where the ancient theater was. This, you can tell, also seems to be some sort of auditorium. That's the so-called Odeon, uh, uh, a form of uh, music hall or a place to listen to performances and musical performances, a smaller theater. There's the Odeon. Temple of Apollo, the Lycaon Road. I couldn't get the graph. The uh, uh, here's the Lycaon Road as well, and with its various shops on the side. And here is the so-called Agora. So this is the downtown area. Uh, people would aggregate, uh, um, would gather in the, the in the core here of the Agora. Um, you have a number of porches or stoas. I was always confused why these ancient Greek agoras uh, have porches around them and it's really just to keep the sun off people if you're if you've been in Greece in the middle of the afternoon you know how sweltering the sun can be and so in any in the uh, agoras of these ancient Greek cities they would have porches where colonnades in other words where people could walk and get out of the sun but still hold conversations and um, we'll talk about the bema the place of judgment in the city of Corinth there that can also be seen today it still exists there. We're going to jump into the city and, and start looking at photographs of what the city looks like as we visit it uh, today. And these are the main sites that we're going to be looking at. But very quickly, I want to make sure that I haven't lost anybody. Does anybody have any questions or, um, or comments at this point? OK, great. I'll, I'll power on. Well, the first place that I want to take you to actually is the uh, Acro Corinth. Here it is. This is what it looks like. <clears throat> I've had the privilege of being to the uh, ancient site of Corinth several times, maybe three or four, actually, maybe five. I can't remember. And one of those, on one of those occasions, I think maybe only three times. I think I miscounted. Maybe three times I've been there. And on one occasion, I took the luxury of walking all the way from ancient Corinth down here, the site of the archaeological uh, area, up to the top. It took about three hours to get there. So it's a, it's a fairly long walk. Here's again what the, the Acro Corinth looks like in a graphical reconstruction. Here's the archaeological site as it appears 
um, in Google Earth. And so you can walk up there. You take this road up here. It takes a very long time. And I burned through, I think, at least two liters of liquid uh, under the hot sun. Now, I wanted the experience of walking up there because many ancient Greeks would uh, would stop in. Uh, here's the here's the archaeological site again and walk up or take a cart ride up to the top of the Acro Corinth. Now, um, the Acro Corinth. Uh, once I was up there, this the top, the very top of, of the Acro Corinth. Uh, on there in antiquity was a temple dedicated to Venus. Venus, of course, or Aphrodite, the goddess of, of love. Uh, it, according to Strabo, Strabo is an a ancient Greek geographer who tells the tale that this, this uh, temple was also running a sacred brothel with, that had a thousand prostitutes. Now, that's impossible. I've walked up there. Uh, here's the remains of the Temple of Aphrodite. The ancient type temple is not nearly so big. <laughs> it could not possibly have had so many people up there. But there was a, a rather notorious brothel, a, a, a temple cult uh, up there. This is the, re the remains, the foundation walls of what's left of the Temple of Aphrodite. Um, and surely there was a, a brothel up there. It had become very famous um, and sort of tied to the civic life of the of the city of Corinth. I'll spare you some of the details, but um, there's a, a number of, in Greek culture, there's a number of ties of sort of promiscuous sexual uh, practices with Corinthian culture. Corinth had become notorious or famous for its, uh, uh, for its sexual culture. And so when Paul gets there. He has quite a lot of work to do to try to explain what a Christian ethic is uh, concerning sexuality and marriage to these people. Uh, I popped up there and after the three hour walk, here you can see the isthmus as it appears in an actual photograph that's about that four kilometer span. I walked up there and I was quite tired after the walk and sat down on the wall of the temple there and had my sandwich. And what I was struck by as I was there is just the amazing pan uh, panoramic view. And it's not just like going up to a, a, a city and looking down from a skyscraper. It's not just the, the grandeur of seeing the city below, but especially the view of this isthmus, which is astounding today as well as in antiquity. So... Um, Yes, I can imagine that a lot of people were coming up here, and I'm sure too that there was also a thriving, uh, there's also a thriving sex trade that must have been plied here at the Temple of Venus. Now, Paul, entering this culture and trying to bring uh, an understanding of the of, of the Christian mission, a Christian gospel to this place, had a very, shall we say, he had, a, he had an uphill climb. The uh, the cards were stacked against him. Uh, Corinth had a very uh, a very perverse notion of human sexuality, and and Paul had a lot of work to do to try to make sense of it um, uh, to the people, a, a Christian perspective on sexual ethics. So this is why in his correspondence with the Corinthians, we have quite a lot of talk about sexual ethics. Of course, maybe most famously is the so-called love chapter in Corinthians 13. And this is what Paul says, love is patient and kind. Love does not boast, or uh, it does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices at the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And um, of course, 1 Corinthians 13 is maybe Paul's most beautiful explanation of a Christian vision of love. There's also some negative uh, example. Paul has to state negatively what Christian love is not to the Corinthians as well. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, he writes this, it is actually reported that there is sexual or immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Paul is um, sort of shocked the extent, uh, the extent 
of the sexual immorality that's taking place in Corinth. And um, I think what had happened from the, from the references that we have in, in the Greek literature of the time is this temple of Aphrodite had become, um, the, the city had capitalized on, capitalized on its relationship with this, this temple cult. So you imagine, you know, people bringing in goods from all over the Greek world. Corinth is a, is a metropolis. Every, every uh, many roads are running into the city. And as business people come in, they're encouraged uh, by the city to, to go up to the, uh, to the Acropolis, get a, get a great view of the uh, surrounding area, uh, presumably have a great meal and, and maybe visit the local brothel there too. It'd be, it, the, the sex trade had become um, uh, tied in with civic identity. And so Paul really has to work hard to explain to the to the Christian community there, the new Christian community there, um, how to think very differently than uh, than the, the local folks were thinking about these issues. In um, it's not just Corinthians five, it's not just Corinthians thirteen, but Paul will revisit this question of uh, Christian sexuality in First Corinthians seven, and again the whole chapter is given over to what we could loosely call Christian social uh, uh, sexual ethics. In this case, the question of marriage and whether how uh, marriage should be negotiated, or the, the meaning of Christian singleness, etc. So Paul also, he starts that chapter. It's a, it's a full chapter discussion. He says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And then Paul goes on from there. Okay, um, that is the Acro Corinth. Let's visit the Temple of Apollo in Corinth, and that's going to take us to the very center of the ancient city. So let's dive in and let's look at this temple. This temple is uh, pretty much all that remains of it is, is what you see um, here in these photographs. Um, the temple was built in the 6th century BC. Uh, Corinth, even at that early time, was a very successful colonizer. I think their colonies extended even as far as the Black Sea in those early centuries. Um, so uh, this, during this time of great prosperity of Corinth in the 6th century BC, the Temple of Apollo was built. And um, when Paul arrived in the city of Corinth, this would have been at the very core of the city. I, I, I've studied Christian history for a while now, but not until I started visiting these Greek cities and seeing how the temple was at the very center of all of these Greek cities. It's a, a, common, it's a common feature in all of these Greek cities. Not until then did I realize what the Christian apologists were up against when they started bringing uh, Christianity to pagan culture. And what Paul would have faced too, as he brings the gospel into this pagan culture. I did not appreciate the weightiness and the power of uh, the power of the grip that, that uh, paganism would have had on these cities until I saw this. When you come into an ancient Greek city, not just Corinth, but any Greek city, the temple is at the very center. And uh, it's a very imposing building. It's a very powerful building, very much like when we come into um, uh, a city like uh, Chicago or a city like Frankfurt or a city like New York or Shanghai. When you come into our modern cities of our modern world, London or, or uh, take, take your pick, um, at the center of them, you of many cities, you will have uh, skyscrapers. And the skyscraper, I think of Shanghai, for example, the center at the core of that city is built up by financial industry. I spent a few years in New York studying there at Fordham University, and I, I would often go down to Manhattan and enjoy some cultural event or something, a museum down in Manhattan. And the financial industry down in Manhattan is, it was for me a continually impressive sight. I'd go down to the core of the city, look up around at these uh, amazingly tall buildings and sort of experience a sense of awe or experience a sense of power. And Paul would have had very much the same sense as he was walking around these temples. 
these grand, very expensive buildings, which just emanate this sense of power. And of course, what, what a temple stands for is no question. Uh, it stands for uh, the, the social power of paganism in Greek society. So when Paul walks into these cities with his Christian message, preaching the resurrection, um, he had uh, a, a huge amount of boldness um, and willingness to challenge uh, and go against um, strong opposition. Here's the remains of the Temple of Apollo. Of course, it stretched for many meters uh, to the left of this image, but this is all that's remaining is six pillars here, and that's the Acro Corinth in the background. Okay. Now, Paul does face paganism, and he's willing to, to uh, challenge paganism directly. We get a hint of this in 1 Corinthians 8 when Paul writes this We know that an idol has no real existence. And that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and, and from, for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Um, Paul is willing to challenge paganism head on. And I think we just have to admire his willingness to go against uh, standard culture in that context. Let's look for a moment at the Agra. Here's the Agra. This is the shopping district of ancient Corinth, if you will. Of course, the Agora is the marketplace. Um, it's, it's also the place where people would congregate, do financial deals with one another. And there's a great amount of economic activity taking place here in the, in the Agora. It's also the place where the Roman governor can make judicial, uh, can, can hear cases, can, uh, um, court can be held there at the Bema. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Okay. Here's the Agora as it appears today. It's, um, it's a fairly large space. And this is also where many of the items that have not otherwise been able to be reconstructed have been uh, amassed. So because it's a big open space, the archeologists have used it also as a space where it's filled with, with other artifacts. So it's a little bit cluttered as you visit there today, but you get some idea there. You can get some idea of the size of the space. We're looking at about half of the Agora here. It would take two or three minutes to walk directly across it. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to this row of shops right here, okay? This row of shops right here, because and that, whoops, that is this row of shops right here. It's right on the other side of the Temple of Apollo, and it, and it borders one of the sides here of the Agora. So now let's look at, it's a, I think it's number 17 on our map, right, right there, this building. That shows up right here. This is the building here. Some of, it's an arched, it's a series of arches. And in these arches, here you can see the same building. One of those arches has been reconstructed, but this would have been a series of arches and these were shops. In fact, this is the ancient meat market. This is where uh, in the morning, uh, bulls and other animals would be sacrificed up here in the temple of Apollo. And uh, there'd be a religious significance obviously to that act, but there was also an economic significance to that act because the meat then would be sold here in the meat market. And um, there it is. There's the building right there. And this can help shed some light on why Paul uh, addresses the question of whether meat that's been sacrificed to idols should be re retailed. Uh, this is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, uh, you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his, if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? For the Corinthians, this was a real question. Should... The meat that's been sacrificed to an idol here in the Temple of Apollo 
and resold right here on the, the edge of the agora, should a Christian uh, family purchase that meat and eat it? Or has it been somehow contaminated because it was of an animal that had been sacrificed in the temple? Now, I find that really helpful because when you're just approaching uh, the Corinthian correspondence as a, as, a pad, as a body of literature, this question might seem a little recondite or a little obscure. Uh, but when you visit the site there and put these things together, it's quite, uh, quite common sense to see how it is that this could be a real question for Christian families in Corinth. Let me draw your attention to the bima. Bima is a transliteration of a Greek word, bima, that means judgment seat. It's, uh, it shows up several times. Sometimes we'll talk in Christian theology about the bima seat of Christ. You may have heard that expression. And that means that that's referring to Christ when he sits in judgment over the world. What that's, that's that word bima, judgment seat. Now, let me give a little, quickly before we go and look at the bima, let me give uh, just a little background. In Acts 18, this is the part of the narrative of the Acts of the Apostles where Paul is in, in uh, Corinth. While he's there, there is a riot that erupts. And let's, let's read this account very quickly. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. That word tribunal in, uh, in Greek will be bema. So Paul is going to be brought to the center of the agora where the bema was. And this is where this action is happening. Saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. That's again that word for bema. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Okay, this is a really an amazing moment in Paul's, in the account of Paul in the Acts of the Apostles that we have, because this is the one moment when we know pretty much exactly where Paul was, and pretty much exactly at what time. In the account, we read of a man by the name of Gallio. Now, Gallio, from other records, we know was proconsul of Achaia. That's, that's the Roman province of Greece. So that's the, that's the uh, Roman province in which Corinth found itself. Gallio was in this office of proconsul for only about a year and a half, between 51 and 52 AD. So this is the one moment in Paul's entire life when we know pretty much exactly where Paul was and pretty much exactly at one time. This is the one peg on which all of Pauline chronology hangs. When we, when we tell you that Paul was doing this or that at this time, the way that we calculate dates in Paul's life are before Gallio and after Gallio. So here at this moment, as Paul's here at the, uh, the Bema seat, uh, in Corinth, we get as close to Paul historically as we ever can. And here it is. You can visit it today. There you have the, the Greek and Latin letters for Bema. Uh, this is the judgment seat uh, of the Roman, uh, uh, the Roman governor. Here in this, of course, it's just a pile of rocks when you visit it there today. Here in this reconstruction, this archaeologist reconstruction, you can imagine what's taking place. It is an elevated platform. So the throng that's uh, recounted there in Acts 18 would have brought Paul around the judgment seat and gotten the attention of the governor. The governor comes out to address the people. The elevated platform means that the governor can stay removed from the populace a little bit. And there's a little bit of a safety measure there and also a little bit of a measure to help project the, that speaker's voice. And this is exactly where this, this uh, riot was taking place. What can we say about the culture of Corinth based on the, the artifacts that we've been able to find there? Well, really, there have been a lot of 
artifacts that have been recovered. Here's a, an example of um, some, some jugs, uh, some pottery that's been recovered from the city. Um, we've found a lot of wonderful glass work. This, this to me is amazing that the Romans had such fine glass work. This is from the second century AD, so it uh, uh, post-dates Paul by a little. But boy, this is glassware that I'd be glad to have on my table. And um, um, there's nothing primitive about it. It's really very ornate, beautiful glass work. Corinth, because of its situation, uh, because it's, it's uh, um, significance as a gateway city to the Peloponnese it became a very wealthy city. The mosaics that we have in um, ancient Corinth are just spectacular. So, I mean, today we don't necessarily appreciate mosaics. Today we don't have much experience with mosaics. It's not a it's not a symbol of wealth as maybe a fancy sports car would be or something like that. But the engineering and artistry artistry that's required to build um, uh, a mosaic like this is really quite astounding. And to think especially that these stones, I believe are not painted, but that you, uh, the artist had to find stones that, that were natively these colors. So that's really a spectacular achievement. And this is, I think this was on somebody di somebody's dining room floor. So you can imagine having a, going to a wonderful villa and uh, having a wonderful banquet there. Several cities that Paul was working at had house churches. Um, uh, for example, in Colossae, Paul specifically says in his epistle to the Colossians, that the church that's meeting in such and such a person's house, I think it's Philemon, I forget. Uh, um, um, but in Rome, for example, in Corinth, we're quite sure that Paul was working with various house churches. What I mean by that is that they the churches did not have buildings, but they would gather in villas. And that's not so unusual. The, the, the villas were very large buildings. Many of them had rooms where maybe 30 or even 40 people could gather if they were tightly bunched in. Um, um, and so it seems that there were some in Corinth who, from a wealthy class who became Christians, who were opening up their houses to be places of worship for the early Christian community. This is a statue of Emperor Nero that had been discovered at the city of Corinth, dating from just a little after Paul's time there. Paul would have been there again, 51, 52 AD. Um, so just a few years later, this statue of uh, Emperor Nero was standing in the uh, Agora. This is really interesting here. This is a scene depicting the Battle of the Greeks and the Amazons from the theater of Corinth. Just like when you go to a movie house today, they have posters of upcoming features. Well, so did the ancient Greeks. This is, uh, this is uh, of course, a uh, uh, chiseled in stone, so it's not something that could easily be changed. But it's a, it's a show, or, or a, yeah, it's a poster, if you would, um, showing people what they might expect if they were to go in and see a show at the theater. This is a terribly wealthy city. And um, Paul also has quite a lot of work to do to try to convince these people that although they're of uh, massive material wealth, they're still of tremendous spiritual need. So we see this surface as a topic in 1 Corinthians 4 when Paul writes this, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And I'm sure that Paul as he wrote those words, was thinking about some of the really fancy houses that he had been in. Oh my, you are so rich. Without us, you have been kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world. And I wonder too there if Paul was remembering the theater and uh, even some of the posters on the outside. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. Okay. One last stop, and then we're done with our tour, and that is the theater itself. So uh, it's the largest building uh, in Corinth. It, it typically is the largest building in any ancient Greek, Grecian city. 
Um, usually about 10% of the population could sit in the uh, theater. That's a very loose estimate, but some archaeologists use that uh, rule of thumb. And even that's one way that archaeologists could give a very loose estimate to the population of, the, of these ancient cities. So about 10% of the people could be in Corinth. I forget what the estimated uh, population of uh, Corinth is. I seem to remember about 80,000, but honestly, I forget how many. Here we are looking at the stage area of ancient Corinth. So get this pile of rocks in your mind. That's the stage area. That is the foundation way for right here. Okay. So this is where the stage was. And then of course the spectators would sit over here. So you had to access the theater, not from the back, but you had to access the theater from the front parts. I think these here and other doors would be the main doors. So this road here, coming down to the base of the theaters where everybody would have to cross to access into the theater. The, the theater seating was all built into the hill. Hardly anything of that remains today, but you can still see the outcropping of the hill where the ancient theater would have been. Here we are, this is the road that comes down to the theater. Here's the stage area. And this part over here is the, uh, the, uh, seating. So again, you see this road here. I'm going to go back to the animation. That road is right there. And then when, when I took that picture, I'm standing about over here, maybe even slightly to the right of my arrow uh, um, in, as it appears today. Here we go at the very ed, end of the, of the stage area, looking back at the road entrance. Now, there was uh, one of the most amazing biblical archaeological finds uh, uh, was made in Corinth, and it's called the Erastus Stone. It was approximately here on the map, and we'll go look at it. Here again is the theater. This is the road. Okay, here's the road. Uh, here is the road coming down from the, the agro would be over this hill. Here's the road coming down to the theater, and then to the left is the stage area. And you can just see part there of where the seating would be. So the Erastus stone is just to the right of where this image was taken. Here it is, an Erastus, uh, and you can see, uh, you can see E-R-A-S-T-V-S, -S -S, Erastus. There we have the man's name. This stone is about three meters or about nine feet in length. So it's a very large stone. And I believe it was discovered where it currently sits at the base of the theater. Erastus, that's the person's name, pro A E D, for pro for the idol ship, S P sua pecunia, from his own expenses, stra S T R A V I T, strawit, Erastus, for the idol ship, from his own expenses, paved this street. Now, what is this? What is the message of this? Okay, Erastus, who was uh, the, apparently the city treasurer, or excuse me, the, yes, the city treasurer, I think this is NIV translation. Uh, um, so in Romans, when Paul's writing back to this community, he says, Gaius, who is host to me in the whole church, greets you, Erastus, the city treasurer and our brother Quartus. You might not have thought anything of that when you were reading that last time you read through the book of Romans, but here, this Erastus, the city treasurer, who apparently was Paul's friend in Corinth, a fellow Christian, paved this street, this street that everybody would have had to walk down here to get into the theater, theater being a very popular activity. Everybody would have been so glad that Erastus paved that street so they didn't have to get their togas dirty when they were going in to see a show. And Erastus put up this stone to remind everybody of his goodwill to the people that he spent his own money paving this street uh, so that he could be voted in to be uh, the uh, uh, for the idolship or for the this office of city treasurer. Now it's it's quite spectacular, but um, this makes Erastus one of about three people uh, in the New Testament to have epigraphic evidence of their of their uh, work in antiquity. So Pontius Pilate has uh, epigraphic attestation 
Otherwise, uh, although, of course, we know of Jesus and the apostles and the other folks from the New Testament from the Bible, uh, we don't have their names chiseled in stone anywhere. Erastus is one of a very select group of figures who appears in our New Testament, whose name is also chiseled in the archaeological re record. There you have it, Erastus, uh, for the idol ship, uh, paved this street with his own expenses. That's one of the most uh, astounding archaeological bits of our tour of Corinth. Very quickly, and then we're done, the Lycaon Road in Corinth. This is the this is the this is one of the roads leading the city here, leaving the Agora to the city of Lycaea down on the coast. And here, here it is, the Haras Lycaon or the Lycaon Road. Here is the way that the road appears today. Uh, we have no idea where Paul's tent shop would have been, but I like to imagine that maybe that took place here. This was uh, where artisans would come and sell their wares and work. And we know that Paul was working alongside with Aquila and Priscilla. They were also tent makers. They shared the same trade. And presumably, they would have been sharing uh, not only the same place of work, maybe one of these stalls here, but they would have been also sharing the same tools and supplies and working with the same customer base. So Paul is working at their tent shop for a few months while he's in town also working as a pastor. And again, we have no idea where that tent shop would have been. It may not have been in the downtown area at all. It could have been in one of the, the suburb areas, but I like to imagine that it was in this place where the other artisans in downtown were working. All right, well, that has been our uh, archeolo our, our virtual tour of the city of Corinth. Um, we're I'll close out now. I just want to say how grateful I am for, for you coming together for this benefit lecture. Many of you are supporters of Aqueduct Project. I want to say thank you so much for the way that you support our work. Um, 2022 was a huge year of growth for us. You probably know that our prayer rooms are some of our busiest parts of our programs. And by God's good grace, our prayer room ministry grew by 65% this last year, up to an almost 200,000 one-time users of our prayer rooms. There was 199,205 Zoom callers on our site last year. Uh, we give God the glory and thank you so much for what you do to make that possible.